trademark. As you can see, my uh, title has changed from the original announcement. Um, what I decided to do was uh, uh, talk about the Hubbard model, a basic model that many of us in condensed matter physics have been studying for many, many years. Uh, and uh, my purpose is to look at it in various limiting regimes where we, uh, where we understand things and then also explore the, the, uh, the portion of the phase diagram that are not understood. And only at few occasions I will relate to experimental issues uh, but, the, but I'll try to keep my lectures, you know, uh, rather specific and focused on reasonably well-defined problems. Okay. And um, what we'll see, of course, is that in, while exploring the, the landscape of the Hubbard model, there are many regions where you get uh, interesting and non-trivial field theories. You get gauge theories. You get uh, uh, conformal field theories. Uh, and... Uh, and perhaps, and, and there are regimes where ADS CFT has taught us a few things, uh, and I'll of course naturally discuss that too. So let me just begin by, def I'm going to use the blackboard, but uh, I already had a few slides, so I apologize. Some of them I'm going to put up. Let me just define the problem. So it's really extremely simple. Um, you have uh, electrons, which have creation operators C dagger I alpha. I is a site index, alpha is a spin index up and down. And they hop from site to site by this hopping matrix element we call Tij. Uh, and for simplicity, and of course, uh, that was the end of the story. That's the free electron band theory, and uh, which you learn in solid state physics. Uh, but we want to put in interactions, and we put it other than putting the long range Coulomb interaction, which that can be important in uh, some cases. Uh, but for most uh, purposes of this lecture, we'll just put in a completely on site interaction U. Uh, local repulsion uh, between uh, electron and site I with spin up and spin down. Uh, the minus a half is just for convenience because uh, we'd often work in a limit where there's on average one electron per site, and that happens very naturally uh, when you put this minus one half here and the chemical potential mu equals zero. So in this notation, when mu is zero, you're at half filling. Uh, and really, the whole, the whole problem is completely defined by this Hamiltonian operator. Uh, this is the number operator and these anti-commutation relations. So this is a good, so at this point, I'd like to propose in the spirit of uh, Joe's lectures last week, which I saw online, uh, that, uh, and to correct a misconception, that this is really the most beautiful equation. <laughs> uh, because, I mean, ADS equals CFT is certainly very elegant, but I, I doubt you can define the problem for, uh, you know, for someone knowing linear algebra, an undergraduate who knows linear algebra. This is all he needs to know. This is, here's the complete equation, which has in it anti magnetism, Fermi liquid theory, conformal field theory, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, and perhaps even string theory. Uh, in some and maybe even supersymmetry, if you look hard enough, and maybe ADS CFT too, and it's all completely <laughs> contained, just just right here. Uh, so the challenge is to can you write down ADS CFT in one transparency, so that in principle a mathematician could go on a desert island and work everything out. Now, of course, so I could give this to a mathematician and ask uh, ask them to work everything out. Uh, maybe they'll get antiferromagnetism, but probably not much else. And I don't mean to insult mathematicians. I don't think the next matter of physicists would have got all the things that this displays. Uh, but we are, of course, helped by experiments. There's hosts and hosts of experiments, which over the past 20 years have given us uh, quite a nice, uh, some background and guidelines on where to look. Uh, I won't refer to them that much, but that'll be uh, sort of, uh, that's really taught us a lot on the richness of phenomenology that appears from this extremely simple model right here. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so then here's the outline of my talk, uh, of my talks, of many lectures. Things might change towards the end. So I'll begin, uh, as I've already done, by just defining the Hubbard model and the idea of super exchange. Uh, and then today, I, I don't know how far I'll get, but my purpose will be to now look at some relatively simple models uh, simple regimes where we can, in fact, prove, uh, in one case is more rigorous than the other, that you get a conformal field theory. And this is a, 
uh, and we'll derive that. Uh, and the two cases would be the coupled dimer antiferro magnet uh, and, and the, the honeycomb lattice Hubbard model, which is a, uh, not a bad approximation for something like graphene. Uh, so then once we have at least one CFT uh, in our pocket, then we can think about, well, what does ADS CFT teach us? Uh, and we'll, you'll see that there'll be some analogies to the discussion yesterday by Stone and Krishna on how QCD, while not in the large end limit uh, and not supersymmetric, nevertheless has this liquid phase uh, in which, uh, for which the ADS CFT provides a remarkably useful mean field theory and teaches us some qualitative things. And, and I'm going to argue that there's something very similar here. Uh, there are no matrices, there are no gauge theories at the simple level. Uh, but nevertheless, there's this quantum critical region uh, where you have uh, where the conventional Boltzmann type physics doesn't really give you uh, a reasonable starting point for what's going on. But it may well be that ADS CFT is a much more uh, powerful starting paradigm for understanding at least qualitatively what's going on. Uh, then, after I've done that, here all of this will be on relatively solid footing. Things are extremely well established. Uh, then I'll go on to even showing you how you get gauge theories out of the Hubbard model. Um, uh, and I'll write the Hubbard model as actually as a particular form of as an SU2 gauge theory. Now, Mike Hermely in the audience has done very nice work uh, also showing that uh, Hubbard model can be written as an SU2 gauge theory. In fact, this is a different SU2 gauge theory. And the most general formulation is an SU2 cross SU2 gauge theory. And that has, that among its various phases, uh, antiferromagnets, charge density waves, spin liquids, Fermi liquids, Berlin's bond solids, uh, and interesting quantum critical points, which have analogies to supersymmetric QED and also super Yang Mills in three dimensions, which is one of the phases of M theory. So not, we're not going to, of course, find these specific theories, but we'll find theories that look rather similar. Uh, of course, they're missing some of the supersymmetry and so on. Uh, and this is, I don't, this will change as we go along. I may not get this far. Uh, I'll also go and turn to the square lattice and talk about Fermi surfaces and Fermi liquids, um, hopefully connecting up to some of the things that Hong Liu is going to talk about. Okay, so let me then begin with the introduction to the Hubbard model uh, and uh, some very basic facts about it. Okay, so here's the Hubbard model again. Uh, the Hopping matrix element T, U, and a chemical potential. So let, the, the most familiar limit to study this, first of all, is put mu equals zero, and then imagine that u is much bigger than all the t's. We can't solve it to that limit in general, but you can, however, derive another Hamiltonian, uh, which is valid in that limit. And that Hamiltonian turns out to be the, uh, the Heisenberg antiferromagnet, uh, which is defined by these two equations here. Uh, and this Jij is related to these couplings by this, this expression here. So let me quickly show you on the board roughly how that works. Uh, okay. Um, so we're going to look here at u much, much bigger than t. And it's useful to just take two sides. So you just have side one here and side two. Um, so you can do this pair by pair for any pair of sides. Uh, and um, let's put mu equals zero. So if I now, in fact, even take the limit of t being equal to zero, then I can write down the eigenstates uh, of the system. Um, so the, the eigenstates are, well, I can put uh, one electron uh, spin up on one side, one electron spin two on the other side, spin up or up down. Or you could put both of them here, nothing there. Um, or you can put both of them over there. Uh, and then you also have, sorry, there's two more states here, down, down, and finally down, up. Okay, so these are the states with n equals total number of particles is two, um, and for simplicity I put mu equals zero. Now you can check that, of course the total number of particles commutes with the Hamiltonian, and that will decouple in a separate sector, and it's a high energy sector where you have one or zero or three or four particles. Okay, sorry, have I done something wrong? 
yeah, I'm just taking two particles and two sides. So that's the so-called half-filled case. If I have two sides, I can put four particles. So, so the total number of electrons allowed on two sides is, is 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. So the lowest energy states in this limit where mu is 0 and u is much bigger than t are the ones with two particles. So this is, this is already the Hamiltonian's block diagonal. Uh, uh, the total number of states is 16, the 16 by 16 matrix that you have to diagonalize when you have two sides. Uh, I'm just going to pick a block diagonal part of it, which is a 6 by 6 matrix. And the reason is block diagonal because the number of particles commutes with the Hamiltonian. OK, so these notes are actually all written up. They're right here. There's a Xerox of my handwritten notes of what I'm going to try to do. And I'm going to probably screw up things up on the board. But anyway. All right, so what are the energies of the states? Well, if you uh, plug, the, so the T is, let's ignore T for now. Look at the Ni up. So you look at that particular. Uh, so, if, uh, so here, let's see. Um, is it a pointer? That's a pointer here. So if I take side one, there's spin up. So n is one. And uh, there's no spin down. So this is plus a half. That's minus a half. So you get minus u over 4 uh, for this. And similarly, you get minus u over 4 here. So if you just work it out, all of these have energy minus u over 2, minus u over 2 minus u over 2, minus u over 2. And this one, well, uh, this on side 1, you have n equals 1. This is 1, and that's 1. So that's plus u over 4. And when there's 0 and there's 0, that's also plus u over 4. And so these have energies u over 2 and u over 2. So if you look at the energy level diagram, uh, you've got four states which are degenerate with energy minus u over 2 and two states up here with energy u over 2. Um, so that's your Hamiltonian. So now what you're going to do is a canonical transformation um, where you're going to define a new Hamiltonian, H effective. It's going to be some canonical transformation, the original Hamiltonian, some U dagger. Um, and you're going to choose this. You're free to choose any canonical transformation you want. And you're going to choose it so that, let me call the states here alpha, one, two, three, four, and the states here beta, uh, that these matrix elements, alpha, H effective, beta, uh, are all 0. Um, and this is, some, this is something you can do order by order in T over U. And depending on how hard you want to work, you can always do this. So, so this is a very standard. This is basically the normalization group in this approach. You're, you're going to integrate out these states. That's what this unitary matrix, uh, unimetric transformation is doing. You're going to get, get rid of the states. You're not really getting rid of them. You're going to have them decouple from the low energy states. Uh, and when they decouple, you can just focus on the lower sector. Um, now, in order, T, when t is 0, this is obviously true, because they don't mix at all. Then first order in t over u, there's going to be some non-trivial transformation u, which you can then use to figure this out. So this is fairly standard quantum mechanics. It's again, I have uh, I've copied a, this, uh, it's an appendix of cohen tenuji of how you do this. I've copied some uh, formula here, if you want to look it up. Uh, but I won't go through the standard kind of perturbation theory. Yeah. No, of course they will not. No, so so there's well there's all, let me call it alpha i and beta j. So there are four states. Uh, the, these four states, one, two, three, four, uh, they are, they are degenerate, of course, at t equals zero. Uh, but now we're going to go to next order in t over u, and we, when we go to that order, what we're going to demand is this be zero. But of course, as you said, this is not going to be zero. alpha j, uh, this is going to be non-zero, and that's what we want to compute. Uh, and so the, the computation is, is done uh, for you uh, in the notes. And I urge you to go through it if you have never done it before. Uh, it's really not much more difficult than, than doing some simple second-order perturbation theory. In fact, there's a very elegant formula here uh, that this is equal to uh, very much like second order perturbation theory. It's based on perturbation, which is the hopping matrix element. So it's alpha i, uh, the perturbation ht, 
times beta j, uh, beta j ht alpha j is going to be sum over uh, beta j times, now in second order perturbation say you get some energy denominator, which is E of the initial state, E alpha i minus E beta j. But here the, there's an initial and a final state, and you just get the average of the energy denominators. And a factor of one half out front. That's the basic formula, and you can just apply it and work it out. Okay, so when you do that, what, what matrix elements do you get? Oops, I guess you can't see that. Um, uh, I suppose I can can roll it up. Yeah. Uh, you yes, yes, yes. The only the high energy ones. The sum is only over. You're only summing over these states. You're not summing over these here. So that guarantees that all these energy denominators are large. Yeah. Okay, I thought you'd all seen it before, but okay, great. I'm glad to spend more time on it. Sorry. <laughs> this is. So if I were to take the hydrogen atom, and usually when you do perturbation errors here, you neglect the scattering states? Yes, okay. Is that like, is that somehow equivalent to saying you integrated them out, or I don't know? No, no, but I think, you know, suppose you wanted to look at the hyperfine and high. Uh, hyperfine levels in the 1s manifold or whatever, 1, 1, 2p, 2s, 2p, it's one of those manifolds, yeah. then you would get rid of all the 1s, the 2p, the 3s, 3p, all the other states, you could do this. So atomic physicists do this all the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and now there are computer programs that will do this for you to any order you want. Uh, uh, well, but anyway, it, it, this is basically the RG. Uh, the RG, normally we think in terms of throwing states out. Well, that throwing states out, is a, that's a non-unitary operation. So you're not really throwing them out, you're just not coupling to them. They're there, but you just don't couple to them anymore. <laughs> so that's why it's a unitary transformation. Um, right. Well, okay, this is a really neat trick. If you haven't seen it before, I'm happy to spend more time on it. <laughs> um, right, so this is uh, this formula you can find in cohen tenuji's quantum mechanics book is in the appendix, and I've given the reference in my notes. <laughs> And it's just done by this, this trick. You pick a U, you, you just regard U as some, some operator of the matrix times T. You plug this in here, T is that copy matrix element. Plug it in here, that gives you the matrix M. Go back, use this factor, and you'll get this expression. And of course, when, you know, when alpha I equals alpha J, this is just Rayleigh Schrodinger perturbation theory for the, for the second order shift in the energy level. Uh, Okay, so now I apply this, maybe I'll just do it right here. I have these are my four states. I'm gonna get rid of these, uh, and I work out the matrix element. So one of the most important matrix elements that I get is this one, well here's spin one and this is spin two, H effective, uh, this thing. So you're going to matrix element where this spin is going to flip down and that's going to flip up. That's a spin exchange process. And uh, hopefully I got the sign right. You, you find out this is 4t squared. Well, okay. Uh, all right. All factors of 2 and so on are in the notes. Uh, so it's actually 2t two, two squared over u. Uh, yep. Okay. Uh, so this is not the only one you find. Uh, you find various other matrix elements. Uh, you also get a shift, a diagonal shifts, things like this. Um, and that turns out to be minus 2t squared over u, and so on. Okay, so you make the table of all the matrix elements, and you stare at them, and you find that they can be written in a very compact way. And the compact way you can write them so now let me label the states uh, in somewhat. Is there a way to roll this up? Oh, here, okay. Oh, oh 
don't have to leave that on. Leave that on. That's fine. I'll do it from here. They'll be hard to get it back on. Okay, so you have, uh, let's see, there are four states. Uh, uh, let, let, let me come up with a better notation for them. So the states are uh, M1 and M2, uh, where M1 equals plus or minus a half, and M2 is plus or minus a half. And now I'm just using the SZ projection to label the states. And what you find when you work this out is that M1, M2, H effective, uh, M2. M1 prime, M2 prime, uh, well, it has to be spin rotation invariant. So in fact, there's only one thing it can be. Uh, it turns out to be sigma A uh, M1, M1 prime, sigma A M2, M2 prime. Uh, sum on A, these are the Pauli matrices. Um, and the coefficient is, well, I guess, I hope the sign where the coefficient. Okay, well, anyway, it's with up to factors of two is t squared over u. Uh, and this is written as uh, four t squared over u, s1, the spin off on the first side and the spin on the other side. So that's the origin of what's called the super exchange term. So you started off with the Hubbard model, but because of these virtual processes, uh, you're able to flip the spin and you generate the anti ferromagnetic exchange interaction. And roughly speaking, what's happening here is you start out you know, with this state, for example. You go to a high energy state here, where they're both sitting go from here to there. And then you come down, and this matrix element is T over U. This is T over U. Um, and you come down to a state where you flip the spin. Okay, and there's other processes you have to count all of them, and this is what you get. So that I guess is one of the main results. Then, in the limit of large U and close to our filling, the Hubbard model gives you uh, the antiferromagnetic Heisenberg Hamiltonian with spin exchange interactions of order t squared over U between nearest neighbor spins. Okay, so now I can. Uh, so that concludes this part. That's not it. So that doesn't help us solve the problem. Well, at least for two sides, it helps you solve the problem. Of, you know, of course, for two sides, you could uh, diagonalize a 16 by 16 matrix on the computer, no problem. But here, now I can do it analytically, of course. This, this tells me the eigenstates uh, look like this. Uh, there's a singlet and a triplet. Uh, and these are the, this is the state up, down, minus down, up. That's the ground state. The splitting between these states is J, and here's a triplet of up, up, uh, down, down, and then the, the other, the symmetric combination. So th these are the eigenstates, remember now, in, of the effective Hamiltonian, but remember, these are not the eigenstates of the original Hubbard model. The eigenstates of the original Hubbard model di differed from this Heisenberg model by this canonical transformation. So if you want to get the true eigenstates in terms of the original electrons, then that will involve mixtures of various terms here, plus terms of order t over u, which will have double occupancy, which will have electrons for a while both sitting on the same site. Uh, we just remove them at the cost of, you know, because we want to work with this low energy subspace, but those terms are there in the original Hamiltonian. Okay? <laughs> All right, so, so that's the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. So then let's now, so I've, that I've done. Okay, so now let's uh, solve it. Okay, it's, we still can't solve it. Uh, so let's take, uh, as you'll see, even this, the simplest and physically most important case uh, of this Hamiltonian now is in the square lattice. This is realized in lanthanum copper oxide and many other materials. Uh, you have one electron per site. Uh, and it's an insulator, and the low energy is described by this simple Hamiltonian uh, to an excellent approximation. All right, so what do we know? So we, un unfortunately, we don't know the exact 
ground states of this simple looking Hamiltonian in two dimensions. And one day, you know, Bethe solved this in, in the 1930s exactly, but it took us 50 years after that to really fully understand the meaning of his solution. Uh, in 2D, we don't have an exact solution, but uh, for all practical purposes, based upon a variety of numerical uh, analyses, this particular Hamiltonian on the square lattice doesn't su suffer from the famous minus sign problem. So you can, you know, you can take 100,000 spins and really simulate it. And so there's very little doubt about what the ground state is. And the ground state is pictured here, uh, and it's called the nail state and it breaks the symmetry. So the Hamiltonian, the original Hubbard model, as well as this model, is invariant under global SE2 spin rotations, and that's broken uh, in the state pictured here. Uh, and you would pick this as, if you think of these S's as classical vectors. Just think of them as classical vectors, and you want to minimize the energy of these classical vectors, one classical unit vector sitting on, on each side of the lattice. Well, there's an obvious solution, since you want every term to be negative, uh, J is positive here. Uh, so you, each, each spin should have neighbors which point in exactly the opposite direction. So this spin has only down, up spin has only down neighbors. Uh, and it's easy to arrange that on the square lattice. You can't do that on the triangle lattice, but here. Uh, so classically, this model is what we call unfrustrated. There is a unique, well, up to global rotations, there's just a unique ground state. Now, quantum mechanically, what we know from all the numerical work uh, is that the ground state breaks the same symmetry as the, uh, as the classical state with just one small difference. That is, if I now look at the average value of the spin, if I look at the, uh, so, so the square lattice model, if I look at SI, um, for the classical state, well, that's just going to be equal to some unit vector n times minus 1 to the i, or for the classical spin. Well, let's say n, or n squared is, some, is s squared. So the s is the length of the spin, if you want. <laughs> so just think of a classical spin of length s. Uh, and. Uh, then you, you just can, there's one common direction, and there's minus one to the r sub i. This is the staggering, the checkerboard staggering that I've shown up there. Uh, and what you find for the quantum system uh, is that you get, you, well, I'm, I'm going to call this phi minus one to the r i. Uh, so this is for spin a half. And now the length of phi, or phi absolute value, is not going to be the length of the underlying spin. There's going to be some renormalization factor. And if I remember right, it's around 0.6 something. So that's the quantum renormalization. There are quantum fluctuations about this classical state, this simple state. You know, so every now and then, this pair of spins will flip like this. But it'll, on the long term, it'll remember the orientation. Uh, and so there's, a, there's like a 30 40% decrease from the classical expectation value. It's a relatively small decrease, which was, of course, disappointing to many people in the early days of ITC because they wanted a huge decrease to get more interesting uh, uh, quantum spin states here. So this is really, in the end, not so different from the classical ground state. Okay. All right, so for now, so, so that's the square lattice. Any questions? Everyone with me so far? Okay. So, there, so then there's a... Uh, Broken global symmetry characterized by this vector phi, which has a non-zero value in the nail state. Phi is smoothly varying. So uh, phi in this state is just constant. It's the same on every side. Uh, the staggering here has been put in this factor eta i, which is plus or minus 1. Question? Yeah. So how do you calculate that 0.6? Um, well, so again, you do it numerically, or you can do a 1 over s expansion. Uh, by various, so there's various techniques. Uh, perturbative techniques, which actually in the end all work quite well, because it's not such a big deviation from the classical value. If you did this on the triangle lattice, then uh, uh, then you get much larger corrections. And so the issue, I think, the issue has been numerically been settled there for the triangle lattice, but it was it took a much longer time. Triangle lattice is frustrating. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so it's okay. Uh, you get a more complicated ground shape with three sub lattices. 
Any other questions? Okay. All right, so how are we going to get, get rid of this classical state? So I'm going to do this by a trick, and I'm going to use the simplest possible trick here, uh, which it turns out to be experimentally relevant, but not for the cuprates, but for some other materials I'll show you uh, as I go along. So, that, so here I'm going to take this Hamiltonian. I know I've described its ground state, uh, but I want to undergo a quantum phase transition. I want to, as you'll see in a minute, in about the next 10 minutes, I'm going to produce a conformal field theory. Uh, so how am I going to do that? I've just been a very simple change. I'm going to take this Jij, and rather than making them all equal to each other, uh, I'm going to make some of them smaller by a factor of lambda, where lambda is greater than 1. So the green bonds are going to be smaller, J over lambda, and the red bonds is J. And that's it. So this is, this is the Hamiltonian. There's nothing under the rug. These, are, these obey the spin commutation relation, one electron per site. Uh, and I now have, I have something I can put my hand, I have a tuning parameter. Initially, you know, previously here, there was no parameter. J was an overall energy scale. The only parameter was, in fact, S, which is fixed to be one half. But now I have a parameter, lambda, and as you'll see, as a function of lambda, there's definitely a quantum phase transition, and indeed, even a conformal field theory. Um, so how does that happen? Well, so we've already talked about the limit lambda equals 1. Now let's take the limit lambda equals you know, 500. Well, what is the ground state when lambda is 500? Well, then the green bonds are irrelevant. Just throw them out. And now I have a two-particle problem, which I just solved here a minute ago. Well, here it is. Here's a two-particle problem, which I solved with a singlet and a triplet. And, uh, and now I just have a bunch of two-particle problems all decoupled from each other. So these are dimers, if you wish. And on each dimer, I can solve the two-body the two body spin Hamiltonian and, and get a ground state, which I'll represent by this ellipse. And that represents this singlet state between the two spins. So every time you see this, this ellipse, think this state uh, of those two spins on the edges uh, of that bond. OK. So but, yeah. How do I write my? I've ignored them right now. Um, well, okay, I picked them this way. So, okay, <laughs> okay, I picked them kind of sneakily. I picked them so that the most important thing about this arrangement uh, is that each each site has only one red line coming out of it. If each site had more than one red line, I'd be, you know, then things can become complicated. But life becomes simple if each site has only one red line. So in other words, each, each site has just one preferred partner. So you know, each site is, the sites are picking up partners, and there's some very natural way for them to pick partners, because it's the closest guy. Or it's, so, the, so the lattice is dimerized. That's another word for it. There's a very natural dimerization to the lattice. Other than that, nothing else is that more impo as, as important. Yeah. You make the lambdas random. Yeah. Uh, well, that that leads to very different physics. Uh, you get you know you get things called random singlet states and gapless excitations and yeah that's a much richer problem. So here I've cleverly arranged things to make things simple. Absolutely. Was there a question over there? You mean if it switches the entire row over by one? That'll be fine. There's no problem with that. So Take the whole. That's right. That's right. And there's some translation invariance at some scale. Correct. No, as long as there's only one red bond, you're OK. OK. Uh, you know, just moved it over. OK. The interest, so, so you'll see it. So this is getting ahead a little bit. But when you do this, something simple like this, and you look for quantum critical points, you end up getting just simple Landau-Ginzburg theories, or field theories in terms of order parameters. Uh, whereas if you have something more complicated, you have you know, degeneracies in the ways you can arrange the uh, singlets, that's when you get gauge theories. So I'm going to show you how that works, but I'll begin with the simplest case where you don't get a gauge theory. Yeah. How can singularities come out of the, come out of the How can what? How can singularities come out of the 
Just wait. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is there a particular material we can think of as an example? I'm going to show you one. Just wait. <laughs> I, I, when I give this, when I give a colloquium, I show the mini material at this point. I thought in this audience, <laughs> let's keep the experiments to the very end. <laughs> let's just show the model. <laughs> Anyway, next time I won't do that. <laughs> OK, uh, right. So here is the critical point. Next slide. So now I vary lambda. So I know for lambda large, I have this very, OK. This, this, what are some of the features of this state? First of all, SC2 symmetry is preserved. So I went from a state where SC2 symmetry is broken. Here, SC2 symmetry is preserved because this thing is rotationally invariant. It's, you take a singlet and you rotate it in any direction, you get the same thing. Uh, and so, in fact, the, the Hamiltonian doesn't, does not have the full symmetry of the square lattice, but the ground state has the same symmetry as the Hamiltonian. Uh, and SU2 symmetry is preserved. And as I'll argue in a minute, this state has a gap. And we'll look at the excitations in a minute. But just following the ground state, then, as a function of lambda, I go from a state with SU2 symmetry preserved. I know at lambda equals 1, SU2 symmetry is broken. So there must be at least one point where there's a singularity where I first break SU2 symmetry. We, in fact, know there's only one point. And for this model, we know the position of that point about five decimal places, again, by numerical studies. I'll show you those, I'll show you those numbers also. Yeah. So if this QD system or OCD system? OK. This will work in any dimension. And how about the Coleman theorem? Does this contribute to the Coleman? So Coleman's theorem uh, is for 1 plus 1D, for relativistic 1 plus 1D systems, or 2D systems of finite temperature. So if I raise this to finite temperature, then this symmetry will be restored immediately. And that's Coleman's theorem. Uh, OK, I'm going to defer finite temperature for a while. Yeah. No, that's fine. Yeah. It's always relevant in these cases. It's strongly relevant. Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to ignore it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, maybe. I mean, as a function of lambda, well, I'm going to do an RG, but it's useful to do the RG in the field theory language. At least that's the way I'm going to do it. You can think of this unitary transformation, as I said earlier, as an RG transformation. Uh, yeah, no, actually, there is, OK, the way to think about it here in the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. So I wrote this wave function down at lambda equals 0. This is the ground state at lambda equals 0. But the actual lambda is not 0. Well, sorry, lambda equals infinity. 1 over lambda equals 0, this is the ground state. But lambda is some large but finite number. So I can now do, again, a unitary transformation, very much like the one I did before, to get rid of the other excited states. Uh, and that unitary transformation will renormalize lambda back to infinity. So there is kind of an RG flow here. Well, in this picture, the lambda basically flows to infinity. So this phase is described the lambda equals infinity fixed point. Similarly here, as I said, the, the ground state for s equals 1 half looks very much like the ground state at s equals infinity. So on this side, there's an RG flow all the way to s equals infinity. I mean, lambda doesn't make much sense after a while before it becomes bigger, bigger than 1. Uh, so but anyway, so there's a critical point, and the RG flow is away from this critical point. So the RG near lambda c in this language uh, if you do an RG, here's lambda c. It's this way when you go to the infrared. And, and so that special point is a scale invariant point, and that's where the conformal field theory is going to reside. Yes, it's about, I'll show you the value in a while. It's about 2.5 something. Yeah, it's known to many very accurately. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's why. So I, that's this is lambda is not going to become less than one. When, when lambda, there's there's actually a mirror. There's actually two CFTs, one for lambda smaller than one, lambda bigger than one. They're kind of the same universality class. Uh, all right, let's lambda is not going to be run below less than one. <laughs> so once I lambda becomes, you know, then then I I really have to use S to think of the RG flow continuing on that on the other direction. Uh, it could be, but for this particular model, there's. You know that it's not because you wouldn't be telling us about it otherwise, but you know, 
Uh, well, so you can do various model calculations, or you can just put it on a computer with 100,000 spins. And you, as you'll see, you get a beautiful second order critical point. Why don't I show you that now, since everyone's asking about this? <laughs> uh, OK, so here's the result of the Monte Carlo simulations. Um, all right, so where's the value of the critical point? I don't know. So the critical point, the value of lambda is not written here. There's various critical exponents uh, determined for a variety of different timerizations, nu and beta and eta. And as you can see, they have been determined to three significant figures. And what I'm going to show you, this last line is the six-loop RG calculation using field theory, um, which is the conformal field theory. And, and you can see just essentially perfect agreement between this numerical study of model like this uh, and the field theoretical uh, calculation from, uh, from the Wilson-Fisher fixed point that I'm going to describe in a minute. So this kind of result is proof that not only is it uh, not first order, it's, it's a second order, it's scale invariant, it's also conformally invariant. I mean, that point uh, agrees beautifully with the conformal field theory results. Two plus one. Two plus one, right. right. For the square lattice type model. It's been done on a variety of models of this type. So this, I mean, this is a you know, beautiful set of results. It's really, the, uh, I think, the best demonstration we have of, in a simple generic lattice model of uh, realization of a two plus one dimensional CFT. OK. Um, all right, so this is the phase diagram then at zero temperature. Uh, and as I said, what we're, one, thing, one point we're going to be very interested in is the wave function here. Now, in both of these regimes, I could write down a simple wave function by this RG idea of just scaling away to some limit. Uh, where, I, uh, where the physics is quite local or classical. Uh, but here I can't do that. It's scale invariant, so I can't write down a simple wave function. And so there's a, you know, a strongly interacting phase of matter uh, whose properties we'd like to know and where traditional weak coupling methods don't work very well. OK, so what are the excitations? So let me, uh, what are the excitations of the two phases? Well, again, just by using this uh, RG to simple limits, I can figure out the excitations. On this side, well, I, I wrote the ground state to get an excited state, but I just take one dimer and put it in the, in the upper triplet right there. So when the green bonds were exactly zero, this is still an eigenstate. But now there's a difference from the ground state. The ground state was unique uh, when lambda was infinity. But now, how about the first excited state? This first excited state is not unique. It's n-fold degenerate where n is the number of dimers because I can put this guy anywhere I want. So I have an n-fold degenerate manifold. So at this point, the 1 over lambda corrections are going to be much more important because I have a degeneracy and I have to split that degeneracy. Well, how am I going to split that degeneracy? In this case, it's relatively simple because I have translation invariance. The only thing I can do is form plane wave states. So this thing is just going to move around. And that's a particle. So I'm, I'm emergent, I have an emergent particle coming in. It's a spin one particle, which is a boson. Uh, it has a finite energy and a finite, finite energy gap. Uh, and near the critical point, it's in fact going to become a relativistic massive particle. But, but here at spin, I should emphasize, spin at this point is just a global flavor symmetry. Think of isospin. It's not like Dirac spin. It's really a flavor symmetry like isospin. That's because of, you know, this SU2 rotation of these spin operators has nothing to do with any space-time transformation. It's just a global transformation of some flavor index. This, is get, this can get confusing, and sometimes you go back and forth. In some cases, spin is a direct spin, and in other cases, it's a flip. But in the, from the context, you have to just think back and figure out what's going on. Anyway, so here I have a sharp spin, spin one excitation. Uh, and what about this side? Well, on this side, I have a broken symmetry, so my excitations are Goldstone bosons. Uh, and those are just long wavelength excitations where I rotate all the spins. Uh, so we call them spin waves. And these are gapless, uh, like any Goldstone boson. And so I have a gapped excitation here. The spin one particle has three polarizations, because I have three states here for on each side. How many Goldstone bosons do I have here? 
Any guesses? <coughs> Not from the people who know, from a, from a string theorist. How many goals and bosons do I have in this space? <laughs> I have a vector. Uh, I have an SU2 global symmetry, and I have broken symmetry here. So how, how many goals and bosons? I can go this way. I can go this way. So two, right, great. <laughs> So I have two Goldstone bosons, which are gapless. Here I have three massive particles. So again, showing you these are very different states with very different spectra, separated by this critical point. OK. All right, so what is, how do I describe this point? So now I'm going to turn to the blackboard and derive a field theory for this critical point. Yeah. Well, uh, yes, correct, in general. But that, that, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't matter. I mean, I'm, we're talking about long wave excitation. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, the, Hamiltonian, uh, the Hamiltonian has some complicated lattice symmetries. The nail state breaks uh, only the SE2 rotation symmetry for this ladder. There's some combination. There's a combination of spin inversion and a certain lattice translation along the diagonal or something. I may not get it right. No, if, you, if I. If I translate vertically, there's a combination of rotation by 90 degrees, rotation by 180, and translation in the y direction, which is not broken by the nail state. So, OK. That could affect some quantum numbers at high energies, but it doesn't affect the Goldstone mode counting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's come entirely from the 1 over lambda correction. And again, you do it. You know, this is the most, just do it by this method. You do exactly the same thing now. You start with a degenerate manifold. Uh, you're going to integrate out some higher excited triplet states. You do this unitary transformation to get rid of the coupling lambda. And, and actually, no, it's even simpler than this. It's first order for division here. You don't have to go to second order uh, because it's a degenerate manifold. So you just work in the degenerate state and diagonalize it. You just have to diagonalize an n by n matrix. N is the number of dimers, but you can do it exactly because it's just by going to the momentum eigenstates. So it just takes one line. But if you wanted the next order correction in order 1 over lambda cubed, uh, you could do it with this. <laughs> yeah. Of course, yes. The velocity would be different in the two directions. Uh, well, so we'll come to that. I mean, you can scale it away near the critical point. You just change your x coordinate, and uh, you just do a shear trans. Well, yeah, you do a shear transformation, and it becomes uh, rotationally invariant after that. Okay, so so now what I'm going to do is derive the field theory for the critical point, um, and. Uh, And I'm going to derive it by mapping it out to another model that's going to play an important role in several of my lectures, uh, and that's the quantum rotor model. <coughs> Actually, this model goes back to the particle physics literature in the 70s. I think Susskind and Fradkin and various people looked at such rotor models. Uh, Tom Banks, maybe, also? <laughs> I don't remember. Did you, Tom? I think you did. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but as I'll show you, it's nothing but the coupled dimer and ferromagnet, which is the model I've been showing you about. All right, so let me. Okay, so we started with uh, two dimers. Let's take two dimers, and 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 look at the states. So, I mean, imagine here's lambda, j over lambda. I need a better chalk. Um, so on each side, I had, uh, this is side one, side two. I, um, these are now sort of pairs of spins, sorry. So dimer one and dimer two, I have a singlet level. If I diagonalize the Hamiltonian on this dimer, I get a singlet and a triplet. And here also I have a singlet and a triplet. And to leading order when lambda is large, I just put everything in the singlet. And then I can eliminate the higher states by some continuous unitary transformation. So the ground state is just a product of singlets. Okay. 
Um, so now let me write down. So here's my, this is the Heisenberg model. Uh, let me actually label the spins. So and let me call this A and B. Okay, dimer A and dimer B. Uh, one, two, three, four. My Hamiltonian is J S1 dot S2 plus S3 dot S4. So this I call H naught, and I call H1 is J over lambda S2 dot S3. And this, you know, I will actually in the end need some inversion symmetry, which this model doesn't have. So it's extended in the lattice to way to get the right inversion symmetry. Okay, so here I'm going to write down another model, which I'll call the rotor model. And the rotor model has uh, consists of a particle moving in a sphere, or some rotor, and one rotor for each dimer. Um, so I'm going to label the sites of the rotor by A and B, because there's a rotor for each dimer. So I'm going to have this uh, two vectors, LA and NA on each dimer. And they obey the following commutation relations. Uh, and they are vectors, so LA alpha, L. Well, they commute on different dimers, so everything is diagonal in A. Is I epsilon alpha beta gamma, L gamma. This is the commutation of angular momentum. And schematically, Ln is Fi epsilon n, and n n is 0. So these are, of course, nothing but the commutation relation of, a, of x and L, of R and L, the position and angular momentum of a particle. These are the commutation relations of n is the position, L is the angular momentum. Mm -hmm. And my Hamiltonian for the rotor model also going to have an H naught will be. Uh, well, g over 2, L A squared, plus, well, I'm going to put it on the B side, 2. And my H1 will turn out to be, well, I'll call it, well, I'll put a J here, well, call it K, K, N1 dot N2. There could be other terms in general, but okay, let's just keep that. All right, so I just pulled this out of a hat. Here's some Hamiltonian. Solve this model. So what is this? How do I think of it? Let's think of this fictitious rotor particle moving on a sphere. This is the, k is the inverse of the moment of inertia, the L squared. So that's just the angle of kinetic energy of a particle moving on a sphere. Uh, and then these particles on neighboring spheres, on neighboring dimers, are connected to each other. They want to be parallel to each other. Okay. Rough, well, yeah. So they put a negative sign there. <laughs> Um, all right. So this is still a complicated model to solve, but I've written it in a way I'm going to imagine g is large, just like over there lambda was large. So when uh, for large g, what are the eigenstates of this thing? Well, I have a rotor on site A and a rotor on site B. Well, what are the levels of the rotor? Well, it's got a single ground state and a triplet and a quintuplet and so on, because this is the L equals 0, L equals 1, L equals 2. And the energy, of course, is uh, E sub L, is G K over 2, L into L plus 1. All right, and the same on B. OK, now if I look at this, uh, I compare these levels to that levels. And of course, it starts looking similar. They have, there's a singlet and a triplet, and no more. So the only thing different in a rotor is it's got a whole infinite set above. But as we'll see, when we go near the critical point, the critical point is a point where the triplet, this gap vanishes. So, and well, there are also some higher excited L equals two states that vanish, but they don't sit on a single rotor. Anyway, it, it might seem reasonable at this point, but no, by no means prove that at least for large G, and large lambda, if I'm just focusing on the low energy sector of just a few exit, dilute sets of excitations uh, on these rotor on these rotors or on the dimers, that the spectrums map onto each other. They, they only differ by some high energy states. I don't care about anyway. Okay, I know it seems seems like a drastic step, but 
In the end, it leads to a result which has three decimal place accuracy, as I showed you already. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do then is we're going to say that uh, uh, rather than work with this model, we work with that model. Now you can also check then uh, that between, you know, there's, so there's four states here and four states here, they have various matrix elements from H1. Uh, and similarly, there are, again, if you look at the low energy subspace, there's four 16 states here. Those 16 states have various matrix elements from H1. And, and you can find that they match onto each other, provided you choose K uh, somehow proportional by some constant to J over lambda. I'm lying a little bit there. There are also some additional complications. There can be L dot N terms here, uh, but because you, this particular model doesn't have reflection symmetry. But if I take the infinite system, I take an infinite chain of these, where you can do the same argument, this is, this is correct without any further cheating. <laughs> And I do have an infinite chain of them. Okay. So, so plausibly, at least for large G or large lambda, these models are similar. So then you can say, well, so, so I, I'm certainly happy that when I'm in the large lambda phase, I could use the rotor model as an effective description of my theory. Can I use it in the lambda equals one phase? Well, to see that, you simply have to go and go to a phase where you break the rotational symmetry here. This model can also break rotational symmetry and look at the quantum numbers in the nature uh, of the critical point. And it turns out, if you do that here, you get basically the same spectrum. Of course, quantitatively, it's not going to work that accurately. But if you're interested in universal properties of the phase transition, they're all basically the same. And uh, so, so we're just going to assume that to describe the critical point, I can work with the rotor model rather than the spin model. OK? It's, it's, and I, I admit it, I haven't made the best argument for it, um, but in the end, it, it, you know, it, in the sense of symmetry and universality, it works out beautifully um, and quantitatively precisely. Um, if you want to get real numbers for a comparing with an experiment, you should really work with this. And in this case, the, this model is simple enough that you can put it on a computer and just get just about pro any equilibrium property you want. Uh, but if you want to get near the critical point and understand some universal characters of the critical point, then this is far more convenient. Yeah? Uh, in fact, they don't even differ by irrelevant operators. That if you go near the critical point, there's some fixed point rotor Hamiltonian, and there's some corresponding fixed point spin Hamiltonian. Uh, provided you maintain all the symmetries of the Hamiltonian, then for each irrelevant operator in one language, there's another one. There's some complicated transformation between those operators, which can be hard to figure out. But the set of operators is identical. Yeah, so they won't even differ by that. All right, so having done that, now the advantage of the rotor model is I know, I know how to write a path integral for it. They're just particles, after all. So I can just write a Feynman path integral for each particle. Uh, so let me do that. So now I'm going to. I have a ladder, I have a ladder, of course, of course. For each dimer, I have a rotor, okay? So I've written my rotor Hamiltonian there, so I'm, a, I'm gonna write down my partition function. It's going to be a Feynman path integral uh, of, over the path of every rotor, and it's moving on a sphere. Um, and then I have an H naught, which is the kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy uh, becomes you know zero to beta uh, d tau. So it's g k over two. It becomes one over two g k. Uh, the kinetic energy is so the one half m v squared. Uh, that's l squared over two m or l squared over two i. So d n a d tau squared. Uh, 
and there's some over A here. And then I have the other term, which comes with a minus sign, so it's a plus sum over nearest neighbors of n a dot n b. Sorry, nearest neighbor a b, n a dot n b, with a k here. Oh uh, no, there's a minus. So this is minus here. And that's it. <laughs> You can, you can. Uh, it's a little, it has very phase terms and various zero side Wisdomino terms, I guess, and it, it's not so obvious how you take the continuum limit. Uh, but in the end, you can do it for that, and it's a little more complicated. You get the same field theory. Yeah. This way, yeah, I think you have a much, you, at every stage, of, you're dealing with physical excitations when you do it this way. Okay, so there's, there's a, uh, you know, there's a field theory of a vector, Na, uh, with couplings between the vectors here and a hard constraint. Okay, so now at this point, uh, you know, it's very, very straightforward. You can try to impose, the, you know, you have a what's called a hard constraint. So you can impose this constraint uh, by putting a term in here, uh, say plus uh, u over 2 Na squared minus one whole squared. And when u goes to infinity, I haven't done anything. But of course, I'm going to let u not be infinity, again, in the hope that in the sense of universality, it's not going to change anything. Uh, and now, I can just take the continuum limit. u. Well, it's on every side, yeah. Um, so in the continuum limit, I'm going to, it turns out that the continuum limit of Na, which is a site label, uh, maps onto a continuum field phi of R sub A. Now, N also depends on tau. Now, this also becomes tau. And the reason I want to take a continuum limit, sorry, one important point. Now, in this Roto language, what's, what are the important fluctuations of N? Well, n uh, turns out to be the analog of the nail and nail auto parameter. And one hint of that is this, this coupling k has a negative sign in front. So if you work it out, you'll find that's indeed the case. This means that n a wants to be parallel to n b. So the optimal state for n, uh, when g is small, when n is not fluctuating very much, would be everything from be parallel. So the long wavelength fluctuations are just going to be very long wavelength fluctuations of n. So, you know, in condensed matter, this is often the hardest thing. You have some lattice model, and your job is almost done. Once you identify which degrees of freedom you're going to make a gradient expansion in, uh, which are the low energy, long wave, and the important degrees of freedom. So I went through this reasoning, so I've identified it. Once I've identified it, uh, that's where almost all the physics is, in, is encoded. What did I choose to uh, assume very smoothly? Uh, and here is the field N. Uh, and that's, so it's the rotor model field, the conjugate of the angular momentum of the rotor, which turns out to play the same role as the nail order parameter. And so I can now just go from this lattice model to a simple continuum limit. Uh, so in the continuum limit, of course, this becomes a field theory of d phi of r and tau. Uh, and I'm going to get some action s of, well, let me write it as a, uh, D, well, D, if I'm in D spatial dimensions, D tau, some Lagrangian of phi. And the Lagrangian well, will be, uh, you know, you can rescale things a bit. D tau phi squared plus gradient phi squared. Now, Son's question will be that there's a, there's a velocity here, some c squared. The C would be different in the x and y directions, but just by rescaling x and y coordinates, you can make them equal. In fact, you can put C equals 1 at this point, uh, plus S phi squared plus U over 2 phi to the fourth, something like that. So this is basically what's called the lambda phi port field theory, uh, where phi has three components. So the three-component lambda phi port field theory. 
I guess field theory is called as lambda, but since I've used lambda for something else, I'll call it u. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That would correspond to the fact that the diamonds were all this way? Yes, of course. So if you, if you added to this, you know, cx minus cy, you know, the difference between, is that irrelevant? It's a redundant operator. I mean, you can just get rid of it by rescaling. There are other higher order, oper higher with more gradients, which are sensitive to, like, something that coupled to, uh, yeah, in this case, yeah, there may be higher order term, like the square of that thing, and that is irrelevant, yes. So the field, just the ordinary difference you can scale away, but there is there is no rotation by 90 degrees. There is that's missing. So reflection along the diagonal is missing. Because of that, there are some higher order couplings which you can't scale away. But they are they irrelevant. Are irrelevant. Yeah. Um, yes. Thank you. So that just comes from here. So you take this term and you write it in momentum space. So if you write this in momentum space, it will be n a of k. Uh, well, uh, n of k. You do a Fourier transform. It will become n of k times n of minus k times something like 1 minus cosine kx. Uh, well, you get, well, let's say 2 minus cosine kx minus cosine ky. This is what you get when you take the Fourier transform of this. This is the tight binding model for a particle. And, and now, so you expand the cos this, these cosines, and the second order term will give you this. So this thing in momentum space uh, is, is just that. Yeah? Yes, yes, yes. So that's, uh, OK. So it really, I should have u goes to infinity. That's why you have changed the general function of the Yes, yes, of course. but. Now we know something else, so I could work, there's two ways of doing it. I can work at u equals infinity, and then I get what's called the nonlinear sigma model. And you can look at the field theory in the nonlinear sigma model. Or you can work with small u, and you get the five-fold field theory and the wilson fisher fixed point. Now we know, for, again, from tons and tons of studies that those fixed points are the same. Uh, you can show it order by order in one over n expansion. There's also numerical work and so on. So I, I'm appealing to some sense of universality that it doesn't matter whether I worked in what's called the hard spin limit or the soft spin limit. Now, sometimes they can be very dangerous, but in this case, we know it's, it's okay. Question. Yeah. So, um, could you say how this relates to thinking about R2 in terms of um, looking at spin blocks at various um, Well, uh, the whole purpose of doing all this is now I can just open the books and do RG on S and U. Okay, uh, I could, in principle, you could do that on a real space RG on spin blocks. I have to be done on numerically on the computer, and you never know what you got at the end. Uh, here, I think you, I have a much better understanding. That first of all, you're getting a conformally near a fixed point. You'd never see that from the spin block type argument. Uh, <laughs> uh, many other things become so much clearer in this way of doing it. <laughs> Sorry? Okay. Yeah, well, I've rescaled k. k appears in the velocity c, and there's also some g. So again, there's some overall rescaling factor here. Let's call it z. And I've chosen z so that this coefficient is 1. Uh, it also appears in s. And so it appears that it's hidden everywhere, OK? So the g's and k's and u's there, I'm not keeping particular track of because I never knew what they were in terms of j's anyway. Now I have a new set of couplings. See, I have this S and U. And they depend on everything in the original Hamiltonian. I can keep track of all of that, but I don't want to do it. You know, if, you really, if, you, if you do so desired, you can keep track of it. <laughs> OK, so now that I have this field theory, uh, I can now uh, study the properties of this field theory. And uh, at this point, uh, I think I show you something, show some pictures from the field theory language. Okay, so you're here. <laughs> All right. So now I uh, 
Let's go with the field theory. All right, so here's my, okay, I'll change the notations in here, I apologize. Here's this field theory again. And okay, so now what I know, just by, I know this field theory, if I do mean field theory, has a phase transition when S changes sign, okay? So I've just gone ahead and called S is lambda minus lambda C, because that's an approximate substitute just telling you, just remind you which side you're on, okay? So here's my field theory, and uh, here's, uh, here's the phases I think it describes. So let me show you how that works. So let's go on the right-hand side, large lambda. When, okay, you do all this mapping, what is for sure you'll find is that when lambda is large, that S is positive, okay? And so what's the potential for phi? So here's the, there's some potential for phi, which is right here. V is some constant phi squared plus phi fourth. So I can plot this in phi space. I only show two coordinates of phi. There's really, I need four dimensions to show the whole thing. Uh, but anyway, so think of phi as some displacement of some phonon and some harmonic oscillator. Each phi is some, uh, you know, has a kinetic energy one half. Uh, this is uh, x dot squared plus x squared. So if I just take these two terms, I have a harmonic oscillator. So if, if I ignore the phi to the fourth term, which I can, uh, provided S is large enough, then I have a harmonic oscillator for each momentum K, because I can just take a Fourier transform as a momentum, uh, and for each direction of phi. And this is exactly what you do when you quantize the electromagnetic field, that you have one normal mode of the electromagnetic field for two polarization, and that, that whole beast you call a photon. So here, I have a particle and which, is, which has three polarizations, which has uh, energy gap square root of s. What is that particle? Well, of course, it's there, it's there. we already found that particle. So this particle, you can also reinterpret as the oscillation of the nail order parameter about phi equals zero. And it's a massive particle because the curvature here is positive, it's non-zero. Okay, so this is an important but subtle point, this is how particles are emerging in the field theory language, yeah. Yeah, so absolutely, S and U depend on all the couplings in some complicated way. Uh, but now I'm going to use a little bit of field theory. You know, here's the field theory. When S is po so the field theory, when as long as S is positive, and so are you, you S, think of S as the renormalized S. Now you do some renormalization. You have some massive three-component particles, and S is the renormalized mass. Then this U is basically the scatter. So there's some renormalized scattering between them. Uh, but as long as I create only one particle, I don't have to worry about a scattering of anything else. So uh, there is, you know, all the sophisticated field theory, which quickly tells us what such things do. Uh, I'm not saying that the gap. So if I want to figure out what is the energy gap of this particle, how much energy did it cost to create this particle, this would not be a very efficient way to determine it. In this theory, the, it's just square root of s. That's the simple prediction. You ignore this. Uh, this is a harmonic oscillator, omega squared plus. Uh, you know, dx dt squared plus omega squared x squared, omega is square root of this. Okay, that's it. Um, but if I really want to get the gap, I should go back to my original Hamiltonian. That's the far, by far the most efficient way to get the number, and it works quite well. Okay, what I'm really interested in here is, of course, what happens when the gap vanishes? Then the other methods will fail. Yeah. So, lambda, is lambda was dimensionless. Oh, well, generically, it won't be. I mean, it could be. It could be. But you'd have to fine-tune lots of things. So you do the calculation, you find you always get something linear. They could, you could fine-tune things so that that's the case. Uh, but it won't happen generically. OK, so there's this particle, spin one. Uh, and then what about the other side? Uh, the other side, well, I have Goldstone bosons. And in this picture, Perhaps this way you can quickly, this, from this picture, well, you're breaking, uh, uh, what is it, SU2 to U1, so it's some S, SU2 slash S3, S2 slash S1, some, something, something, and you can count as two goldstone photos. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, so that's basically phi oscillating this way. Okay, so we have reproduced our large, you know, our pre previous analysis 
uh, from the field here. So we're very confident it seems to work on both sides. It gives the same spectrum, the same broken symmetry. Uh, this field theory also has its three goes to two formulation transformation. It has three massive particles here and two goes convolutions here. But it gives us something new. What it gives us, at least near the critical point, and at least in high enough dimensions, um, where the effect of U is not that large, uh, there's another particle, which is the oscillation in this direction. And that's what we call, in this context, would be the Higgs boson. Okay, that's the Higgs boson associated with this broken symmetry. There's no gauge field here, so in that sense, it's not really a Higgs. But, okay, it's the analog of the Higgs in the non-gauge context. Now, okay, I don't know. I'm, let me show the data now. Uh, <coughs> there, there, so there are, of course, then interesting questions on whether this Higgs remains stable near the critical point. Uh, and it, let me just give you the answer. It turns out in two dimensions it's not stable. In 3D, it's okay. Marginally stable. Uh, <coughs> this is spatial dimensions. Uh, so anyway, in mean field theory, anyway, there's a Higgs. Okay. Uh, and there's some complicated critical point, and I'll say a bit more once I show the data of how we analyze the critical point of this field theory. Okay. But let me now uh, show you some experiments. <laughs> okay. So the experiments, whoops. Okay, I'll come back to that. Uh, on this compound. So here's thallium copper chloride. It's a three-dimensional, it's an insulator. Uh, okay, fortunately for us, we can throw out the thallium and throw out the chlorine, and on copper is one spin. So it's, it's, it, has, it's, it is actually described by a Hubbard model on a certain orbital of copper. And why that's a good approximation? Well, okay, there's years of solid-state physics that goes into that, but that's certainly true. All right, so I have my Hubbard model moving on the blue circle. This is what the coppers look like in the actual structure of thallium copper chloride. And you see that the crystal structure is such that there's a very natural dimerization. Each copper has a partner. This part, there, there, there's a preferred partner, preferred partner, preferred partner, and so on. A unique preferred partner. And here's the skeleton diagram. Each copper has one partner and some weaker couplings between them. They're rather more complicated, but it doesn't matter much. The most important point is that each copper has one preferred partner. Now, this is, I mean, one caution is this is a three-dimensional crystal. I'd love to show you data of something like this in two dimensions, but unfortunately there isn't any such compound where you can actually see the phase transition. So the amazing thing about this compound is this, by applying pressure, you can tune lambda, and you can close the gap. Uh, okay, so, so this lambda is actually the axis of pressure in thallium copper chloride. Uh, so here's some actual data. So this is neutron scattering on thallium copper chloride at ambient pressure. So ambient pressure, it's, uh, it's in this phase. And remember, in this phase, you have a spin one gapped excitation. Uh, and so you can see that by neutron scattering, you just send in a neutron, the neutron spin exchanges with the electron and dumps some energy and momentum into the crystal. And uh, you see a sharp peak if the energy and momentum of the neutron, energy and momentum lost by the neutron equal the dispersion of the triplon particle. So this is a peak as a function of energy transfer of the neutron at some momentum scattering. And so from this, this tells you that at, this, at that momentum lost by the neutron, this is the energy of the triplon. And here is the dispersion. So you do this at different angles in different directions, and you can map out the dispersion uh, of this particle. So over the Brillouin zone, it's, of course, rather complicated, but uh, the full line there is the theory. Uh, and that theory is, of course, working with this, all these coupling, J3, J3 prime, J2, all of these are known uh, through the combination of estimates and map, mapping the data. Just so with, with, I think, a couple of... Actually, you know them by an independent measurement in this case. So you know them, and the theory and experiment just work extremely well. Uh, so that's... And, and the most important thing to notice here is that it's always positive, there's always a gap, and that's the energy gap. Okay. So now you apply pressure. If you apply pressure, this gap will close. And when it closes, you will go and you will break the symmetry and you'll go into the, the other phase where you have nail, long range nail order. Uh, oops. And that, that this is the phase diagram of a lot of data now as a function of varying pressure. And what's being plotted here 
uh, ignore this is the actual data, but we don't want to get that messy. Uh, <laughs> what's being plotted is this, this, this gap. So there's some energy. At each pressure, I have some energy that I can report. That's the energy of the minimum excitation to create a, a spin one particle. Okay, so follow, this blue line is the energy of that minimum excitation, and it hits zero at about one kilobar of pressure. Now there's also the black line, if you want to ask me. Uh, that's for different spin polarization. There, there is some spin orbit coupling here. Okay, we won't talk about it. <laughs> uh, then, on, at higher pressure, you see this zero energy. That's your Goldstone boson coming right there. Uh, and uh, the green line is telling you that you have some finite temperature phase transition where the, this broken symmetry is restored. That's really a different measurement. Uh, but the very exciting thing about this paper is this red line. So on the Goldstone side, you see this high energy excitation coming in, and that's the Higgs boson. So Higgs boson has been discovered. <laughs> so how, how can you believe this? Do you believe it? Okay. Well, this is not in this paper. I, I, they sent me this data, and I stared at it, and I said, yeah, it's cute. Maybe it's a Higgs boson. And um, they tried to get in nature, didn't get in. Anyway, preserved letters. And I was teaching a class, and I realized, here, there's a quick way, there's a, actually an excellent way to prove it's a Higgs boson. And very simple. What's the argument? Let's actually look at the energy of the Higgs boson, all right? So, if, and we'll just do mean field theory on this thing. So if I'm on, on the right-hand side, whoops, if I'm on, on this, which is this side, where I don't have the Higgs boson, I have the triplet, excitation. Uh, what is the energy? Well, the energy is just square root of s, as I said, with some factors, but don't worry about the factors. Okay, that's the energy, and it's coming in with the square root, as you see in the data, too. Uh, okay, so that answers one of your questions there. <laughs> uh, how about on the other side? Well, on the other side, you take the same quartic polynomial, this is, and you expand about this point. Okay, so that's the minimum, phi 1. That's the minimum of the potential. Oh, sorry, this is the minimum. This is where the minimum is. Expand about that point to get the curvature there. And what you'll see is there's this factor of two that comes in. Okay, this is just a property of a quartic polynomial. Uh, so this is like proof of Landau Ginzburg theory. So just coming with a quartic polynomial, that the curvature for given value of lambda minus lambda c modulus is twice as large on this side than that. So this means the energy of the Higgs boson is factor of square root of two larger. So the implication of this very simple theory is that this red line is a square root of two higher than the blue line. Right? That, that's, that's, that's what this simple field theory will tell you. And this would also come out of analyzing the spin model in some complicated way, but it, it's not a two-line argument. Everyone caught that? Yeah. Can you, can you use the class two argument that it's three plus one? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so all I'm doing is I'm taking this potential and expanding it either about zero when the minimum is at zero, or at the mirror image point when the minimum is at somewhere else, and then the curvature at zero is square root of two smaller than the curvature here, and so the energy uh, is also square root of two larger for the Higgs particle. And so you just take the data, scale it by square root of two, and okay, it, it works, okay? So that proves that the Higgs boson's been discovered, yeah. <laughs> Sorry? Absolutely, this is all in 3 plus 1. Oh, oh, that's an excellent question. That will go down to zero temperature. So then you have some much richer set of crossovers at finite temperature. Yeah. Good, yeah. I'm taunting you. Okay. I did give that comment earlier, but anyhow, go on. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, so this, these are questions that are being studied right now. So, well, in a sense, because. Is 
Right, right, excellent, absolutely. So, so the, the decay of the uh, Goldstone Bose of the Higgs is determined, or of the sigma, is determined by this coupling U, and, and the coupling U is, you have here, you have infrared freedom. The coupling U scales to zero near the Wilson Fisher fixed point in three dimensions, which is something I'm going to. So, so it, there is, there is a. It's only logarithmic, but it's it's weakly coupled. Uh, so, at lo long enough distances, the Higgs is pretty well defined here. I think so. I think so. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. 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 So Okay. Good. Right. Right. What you've done is to make the sigma narrow at zero temperature. Um, because the field theory is so simple, and of course. Well, not all. Most other quantum critical points, things won't be this simple. And also in two dimensions, this it it's doesn't even exist. It's totally broad. I mentioned that earlier, uh, because uh, U goes to some strong coupling fixed point there. Uh, anyway, so uh, so that's work being done right now. Is to figure, you know, you can see actually that this that's the that's this part. There's the uh, Higgs boson. It's, it, you can see it's reasonably broad here. That's just a plot of the peak energy, and how that width varies in temperature. That's something people are working on and, and studying. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Uh huh. Oh, really? Okay. Good. No, but then you have. I don't understand how. No, but there you're measuring a correlation length. You're not measuring a dynamical excitation. So this square root two certainly seen in the Ising model too, and you know you can see it uh, at finite temperature in some in, in equal time correlation function. <laughs> okay. Great. <laughs> it's trivial. <laughs> Uh, yes, I mean this is really one. Of the, this is by far the cleanest experiment of this type. I mean, there there are of course analogs in the superfluid insulated transition with the boson Hubbard model and coal atom systems, but there's no way they have this detail so far anyway of the excitation spectrum. Um, they're also they're not in infinite systems. <laughs> also, well, both systems have their complications, but this is really one of the cleanest we have. Yeah. Uh, the green line is the nail temperature. That's where the that's that's with respect to so that's a different measurement. You just raise the temperature and, and see where the uh, symmetry is restored. Okay, I have two minutes left, so let me just say a few more things uh, about this field theory for those of you who don't know this. Uh, uh, this field theory. So just a few points about what we know about it, since I'm going to refer to this. Uh, Can I raise the other thing? No. Okay. All right, I'll write it over here. So let's just make a relativistic notation. D mu phi squared plus S phi squared plus U phi to the fourth. Um, and the most famous analysis of this uh, is the Wilson-Fisher analysis you know, in the early days of the RG, where they analyzed precisely this theory uh, and in terms of how what happens when you rescale the cutoff of a theory, how these, these couplings S and, and U flow. So I'm just going to show the results of their flow diagram here as a function of S and U. And I wish I'd written it down somewhere because I don't, I'm going to have to uh, figure it out. Uh, okay, uh, I, should have, I should have made a copy. But okay, let's see if I can get this right. Uh, so the critical value of S turns out to be I think it's usually drawn the other way, so that I don't get confused. Okay, uh, point turns out to be here. So what you find is that there are two fixed points. There's a fixed point here and a fixed point here, uh, and this fixed point is totally unstable. So this is the this is in, in sorry this is an expansion. So I just do this in D 
dx space-time dimensions. And then you write d is 4 minus epsilon. And you do an expansion in small epsilon. Uh, so this thing is totally unstable. And then it flows to this fixed point. And then here, there's a flow this way, and then flow this way, and say like this. So you have okay. So just you know, there's some some analysis involved, but when you do the analysis and look at the RG flow as you flow to long distances in these space of two couplings S and U. Uh, what you find is there are two fixed points, one here, and this is called the Gaussian fixed point. And there's a fixed point in non-zero U, uh, which is called the Wilson-Fisher fixed point. And of course, Wilson-Fisher only de determined it to second order in epsilon. Today, it's known to six orders in epsilon. And the results, as I showed you already, comparing the six-loop calculation of this fixed point to a numerical study on a quantum lattice model agreed to three significant figures. So we are certain that this fixed point exists even in three dimensions, two plus one dimension. So oh, I need a colored chalk somewhere, I guess. Uh, so what is, what is the meaning of all this? Well, so as, I, as we found, these couplings S and U are some function of lambda. I don't know what, some complicated function of lambda. So let's say you give me lambda, I get some S and U. You change lambda, I change both S and U. So I'm going to get some line here, which is my set of initial conditions. Uh, as a function of lambda. So as I vary lambda, I go at different points on some arbitrary line. OK, so you give me some initial conditions. And I hope I'm drawing this correctly. I, this is the, uh, sorry, that's this way. That's, have I got this wrong? Sorry. <laughs> OK, this is not crossing the critical point, right? <laughs> OK, so if you took this condition, you would always end up in one phase. So not good. So you're, that's a bad sample. And we want another sample where I actually cross uh, this line here, right? This one. Yeah. OK, there you go. Here's, my, here's a better set of initial conditions. This is thallium copper chloride. <laughs> and that's. <the laughs> OK, so what do we see here is that if I start anywhere on this side, I flow off to s goes to infinity. So that's the large lambda phase where I have a triplet gap particle. If I'm anywhere on this side, I always end up here in the, in the negative s phase um, where I have uh, the nail order. But right, there's a very special critical point here. So this is my lambda c. So at lambda c, I end up at the Wilson-Fisher fixed point. But it takes a little while. And this corresponds to the fact that I have some irrelevant operators. Uh, and, but eventually, they all scale to 0. And, and independently of where I drew this line, at, the critic, at my lambda c, whatever it is, I'll end up here. And that's the universality. Uh, so that's the scale. That's the limit at long enough scales. I have this fixed point, which is obviously relativistically and scale invariant by the structure of the RG. It's also conformally invariant. Uh, and it's characterized by whole sets of critical exponents. And it's a point that we'd like to know much more about for large epsilon, especially if dynamical properties at finite temperature. And that's where I'm going to argue that ADS CFT like ideas can be quite important. OK, stop there. <laughs> okay. Any other questions?